So thank you all for choosing our session, the best session right now. Um, my name is Katie Patel. As Jamie mentioned, I um, lead client success management uh, at Waystar. Uh, and I have been with our company for about five years, but in this role um, for almost two years. Um, and similar to the story before related to SAP, I no sooner got into my role and really started to study the space. I'd grown, uh, our department grew out of account management, kind of rebranded and we re needed to redefine our roles. And pretty quickly, and we'll tell that story today, we figured we needed a platform to help us enable, uh, enable what we needed to do. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thank you, good morning. Um, I'll echo Katie's comments. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope this is beneficial for you. So I am uh, Executive Vice President for Client Success at uh, Waystar, which is a healthcare uh, information technology company. I've been with Waystar now about 10 and a half months. Prior to that, I was uh, Senior Vice President for Revenue Cycle for a healthcare company called Cerner, for those of you that might be familiar with healthcare. And then prior to that, I was actually a customer um, in the healthcare industry. I spent 19 years with one of the largest health systems and hospital uh, systems in the United States, Advent Health. So I think I have, um, I like to think I have, somewhat of a unique perspective in the sense that I was a customer for 19 years and now for the past three years or so, I'm, I'm serving customers. Um, and I think it always gives me a little bit of credibility when I walk into a client's office, sit down with them, and I'm basically able to tell them, I've sat in your chair, I've walked in your shoes, I, I know the challenges that you're dealing with, and here's how Waystar can help you um, solve some of those challenges. And so I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna spend 10, 10, 12 minutes or so um, kind of framing the healthcare industry and then talking a little bit about Waystar as a company overall and then a couple minutes um, on our focus and philosophy and strategic imperatives for our client experience and client success organization. And then I'm going to turn it over to Katie and she's going to spend 20 minutes or so um, going into the details in terms of here's what we're really focused on and here's how we're leveraging the partnership that we have with Totango to really improve what is already for us a world-class experience uh, with our clients. How do we take it to the next level and continue to take it um, beyond that? So, um, so is, there anybody, is there anybody that's in the healthcare industry? Let me get a feel for the audience. Okay, is there anybody that uses the health? <laughs> How's that working for you? There was a, um, there was a headline in um, one of the industry newsletters, I think Tuesday, um, and it's always interesting headlines, but anyway, the headline said, Americans are fed up with the US healthcare system. And predominantly, um, the healthcare industry is, is made up of two segments. There's, there's clinical care delivery, whether it be physicians or surgery centers or hospitals, et cetera, right? The, the process of going through um, the system to receive care. And then there's the process of going through the system to pay for the care um, that you've received. So in the healthcare industry, we, we refer to that payment process as revenue cycle. Everything from scheduling through registration charging, coding, all the way up and through billing, um, both from a health plan perspective as well as from a patient perspective. Um, and I always find it interesting, I thought about this as I, as I looked at the slide this morning, um, we're all under cost and reimbursement pressure, right? So the healthcare industry, by and large, delivers products and services, very similar to your companies. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are reimbursed for the products and services that you deliver? Hopefully everybody. No, no. <laughs> oh, hopefully well. nobody. You're not reimbursed, right? You're paid. Yes. You provide a product or a service and you are paid for that service. And yet in the healthcare industry, we still hearken back to the days of, of Medicare in the 80s and cost report reimbursements where health systems had to file on an annual basis a cost report explaining their cost structure um, to the federal government in order to make sure that their reimbursement for costs was appropriate. We've moved beyond that for probably at least 15 or 20 years 
And yet in the healthcare industry, we still think by and large of being reimbursed for the products and services. And the point in all of that is the healthcare industry is broken. We are dysfunctional, we are archaic. Um, it was really only about 10 years ago that we started caring about patient satisfaction, right? <laughs> I mean, there are, there are a number of cliches around, uh, around, uh, around um, various industries. Take care of the customer, somebody else will. The customer is always right. Customer service is job one, right? And yet in the healthcare industry, we really just started seriously thinking about patient satisfaction about 10 years ago. And you know why we started caring about it? Because the federal government in the form of Medicare came in and said, if you don't deliver a certain level of patient satisfaction as measured by an independent third party, we're gonna start penalizing you by taking money away from you. Show me any other business in any other industry in any century where you had to have the federal government come in and force you through economic incentives or, or penalties to care about patient satisfaction. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of point number one. Second, second point is high cost, high cost to collect. So when I was on the health system side of the industry, um, I worked for an organization that had about 20,000 uh, people across the entire organization. A little less than 2,000 of them reported to me. So 10% of my health system's workforce was directly involved in some form or fashion in getting my health system paid for the services that we provided. Again, give me any other business in any other industry where 10% of your staff is directly involved in getting you paid. I don't know that another industry exists like that. That's problem number two. And then problem number three is um, a, a best practice uh, provider health system top quartile, will forgo somewhere between two to three percent of their annual revenue that they've rightfully earned and that they're rightfully entitled to in the form of denials or bad debt write-offs or underpayments or whatever. So for a health system that's doing a billion dollars a year in revenue, they're losing somewhere between 20 to 30 million dollars a year of revenue they're rightfully entitled to and they rightfully earned and they're sitting back, patting themselves on the back and congratulating themselves because they're best, best uh, uh, world-class, best, um, best in the world, right? And so um, it's a crude analogy, but the analogy I always use when I think about that dynamic is that the smartest idiot in a room full of idiots <laughs> is still an idiot, right? And so if the entire industry is performing at a mediocre level, and you're slightly better than mediocre, <laughs> that doesn't make you world class. That makes you slightly better than mediocre. Um, so I think I've said enough about the healthcare industry. I think you can all relate with that. My biggest fear, I've been in healthcare for 23 years. I like to think I've got 15, 17 more years. My biggest fear is I'm gonna retire and I'm gonna have spent 40 years in the healthcare industry and it's gonna be as broken <laughs> after 40 years as it was when I started, but anyway. So enough about the healthcare industry. So let's talk about Waystar. Um, I had a meeting a few weeks ago with a client and the primary objective of the conversation was to talk about the current state of our relationship, our partnership, and opportunities to expand our partnership. And about 20 or 30 minutes into the conversation, the CEO looked at me and he said, are you really interested in transforming the industry? or are you just trying to make money off the current dysfunction? I have thought about that question every day, multiple times a day since I had that conversation. And a big part of the reason that I joined Waystar 10, 11 months ago was because I do think that Waystar as an organization is not just committed to our clients and to our customers, um, but we almost feel an obligation and responsibility to actually impact and transform the healthcare industry. And our entire mission and purpose is based on a simple premise, which is that the healthcare industry is fragmented and it's fractured, and it's complica complicated and it's complex, 
And we want to help our customers simplify and unify that whole process flow that I mentioned earlier that today takes anywhere from 10 to 12 percent of an organization's team members. Simplify and unify that entire process to Guy's point this morning, how do you take friction out of the entire process flow so that our clients, the clinical care providers in the U.S. healthcare industry, can focus on their priorities and objectives which at the end of the day is improving the care that they deliver and improving the health and well-being of the, of the communities and the patients that they serve. Very simple mission and purpose, very complicated um, strategy and endeavor. So this is Waystar today. Uh, we have over 22,000 clients, everything from a one or two doc physician practice all the way up to multi-billion dollar, multi-state, multi-hospital facility. Um, health system, 750 hospitals and health systems, 450,000 individual providers of care, 5,000 payers and health plans. We are the second largest processors of, of health care claims in the United States. We are the largest processor of health care claims on a single instant, a single domain cloud based software. Um, so if anybody's going to have an opportunity to transform the healthcare industry, we, we think we're perfectly positioned to, and to my earlier point, we feel compelled uh, through a sense of responsibility and, and, and obligation uh, to make it happen. So, so how do we do that? So at the end of the day, we're focused on two things. Number one, how do we create value for our clients? Measurable, quantifiable, tangible, objective value whether it be through automation, whether it be through accuracy and quality, whether it be improving payment rates to the point I mentioned earlier, about two to 3% of their annual net revenue getting written off. Um, but at the end of the day, how, how do we create a compelling value proposition for our clients and improve all of the pain points that they have to deal with, whether it be on the cost side of their organization or on the revenue and payment side of their organization? And then secondly, and then secondly, how do we do that in a manner that creates a world-class experience, right? So it's that combination of creating value and creating experience and satisfaction that we think is not only the compelling business model, but a competitive differentiator, particularly in an industry like healthcare, where the concept of patient satisfaction, customer satisfaction, again, is only about 10 years old. Um, Guy mentioned again earlier, process flow, how do you take friction out of that? We have a fairly seamless onboarding process. Um, our solution adoption teams in terms of our client implementations, again, I think are world class. We score ourselves internally as well as externally on a multitude of operational metrics in terms of client satisfaction. We consistently deliver somewhere in the 4.8 range on a scale of five. And so we don't just deliver value, but again, we deliver that world-class experience. And then the other thing I would say here, the, the, the last three on the bottom, honesty and integrity and accountability and a partnership. When I was a client in the healthcare industry, I never wanted to do business with vendors. I hate the term vendor. And I know hate's a strong word, but I never wanted to do business with a vendor because I, I, don't, I don't believe in vendor-customer relationships. I believe in partner relationships, right? And a vendor has certain implications in terms of how people think about that, right? It's very transactional. It's one way. It's a zero-sum game. A partnership implies mutual benefit, mutual risk, mutual reward, etc. And so when I was on the, on the client side of the industry, I always wanted to do business with people that were partners. Now that I'm on this side of the industry, I always want to be viewed as a partner. And to a certain extent, I want to be viewed as my client's trusted partner and not just a trusted partner, but the trusted partner in the revenue cycle and, and healthcare payment space. And at the end of the day, that starts with honesty, accountability, integrity, transparency, et cetera. At the end of the day, I would argue that no matter how compelling your solutions or services are, no matter how compelling your value proposition, if you don't have reputational credibility with your clients, you're dead in the water. 
If your clients don't trust you and have confidence and faith in your ability to deliver and be honest with them, sooner or later that relationship is going to fall apart. So with that, with that in mind, when we think about client success, customer success, client experience, client satisfaction, in our minds it really comes down to three things. It starts with incredible solutions whether they be products or services, but what, what is that compelling value proposition? And is your value proposition um, a competitive differentiator relative to your competition? It ends with world-class service. To my earlier point, how do you package value and service in such a way um, as to really elevate the partnership relationship with you, have, with you have with your clients? And then underpinning all of that is operational excellence as driven by outstanding talent, right? Your, your company is only as good as the people that you have, and you're only as good as your weakest link. And so we've really started becoming more intentional and thoughtful about recruiting and retaining the talent, and then over time developing our talent. I think it was Richard Branson, the CEO of Virgin Airlines, that said, most people talk about taking care of their customers first. I believe you take care of your team first, and then your team will take care of your customers. Um, and we believe that, and so we, we've, we've started rolling out a lot of initiatives around talent. Um, what I would say about, you know, about Waystar is we, you know, we have a history of excellence. Um, I won't read them all off, but um, at the bottom is a list of all the achievements and accolades that we've earned. Um, best in class, which is kind of consumer reports for healthcare for 10 years in a row, multiple number one rankings, and so on and so forth from a net promoter score perspective. We consistently score in the mid-50s, and I know for some of you in your industries, that doesn't sound like much. I'm actually a, an advisor for a fintech company. Their NPS score is 78. I'm embarrassed to tell them ours is only 54. Um, but in healthcare, if your NPS is greater than 50, you're considered world-class in the healthcare industry. And so we're, we're, we're pleased, very pleased, with the fact that we consistently score in that mid-50 range, but we're not satisfied and we, want to, and we want to figure out how to drive that even higher. So at the end of the day, as we look to the future, it's really about taking a, a great company with great solutions, with great experience, and growing and scaling that in such a way that we continue to deliver as Waystar continues to grow. And Katie will talk a little bit about our growth trajectory in her section. And the last thing I'll talk about is strategic imperative. So so in the frame of, of the healthcare industry, all the problems that are plaguing the industry, uh, our philosophy, what are, we, what are we focused on at the end of the day? First and foremost, world-class experience. How do we continue to deliver world-class experience from end to end for our clients and our customers? Secondly, revenue realization, whether that be for our clients in terms of improving their payment rates, or whether quite honestly that be for Waystar. I mean, we're, we're a company, we're in business to make money too. Um, but again, we believe that if we deliver value for our clients, that will simultaneously deliver value for our company. Thirdly, and I touched on this a second ago, sustainable growth. Um, I mean, we, we have a stated objective of one to two acquisitions a year. We're expecting to grow exponentially over the next five years. So how do we continue to scale all of our operations while simultaneously reducing those friction points? Um, so that we have a model that's not just sustainable and, and replicable, but is also improving and elevating over time. And then last, operational excellence, day-to-day -day -day fundamental blocking and tackling. How do, how do we do the stuff that matters on a daily basis to deliver the value and deliver the experience that I talked about earlier? With that, I'll turn it over to Katie. All right. So I'm here to talk a little bit more about the road to client success and in essence the story behind the story. Um, so Jeff talked through like all of our great success. We are, you know, top tier firm in our space, tons of accolades, lots of other, you know, we're in the industry, lots of people are like, how are you guys doing it? Like what's, what's making this work? Um, and the reality is there's a lot behind the scenes, right? So um, we have grown through acquisitions. So, um, while it might not be the same scale as SAP, um, we've been doing this very fast. Uh, even since we signed with Satango, we've had two acquisitions, um, and we only signed this spring. So with each of these companies comes 
uh, complexity, right? It, and that has been really the journey to ensure that all of the great success that may have existed at each of these unique companies, some very large scale, some more in the startup nature, that we can continue that and build a sustainable model. Um, so to give a sense for uh, kind of what this feels like on the ground um, when you're going through uh, high, high M&A is, you know, lost time and lack of visibility. There's a lot of effort at times with not great outcomes necessarily. Um, and that, that can lead to burnout. So for example, we had at any given time like five CRM systems, um, you know, all at varying states of integration, multiple pl client platforms where our clients are logging in and experiencing Waystar in that regard, multiple teams. Um, my team grew out of a, a bunch of different account management teams um, and really had to kind of become united and I want to attend that change management session as well, um, but had to go through all of that. Eight product lines um, with, with CSMs that didn't understand the other product lines, so a lot of training and knowledge gaps, um, and infinite processes and operational definitions, um, language, can be a unifier if you all have the same language, and it can be an incredible divider within a company. Um, and, and why does this matter? Obviously, it matters for, for the employees. We want to make sure that our, our team members um, you know, want to be here and, and want to make change. But it's, it, who it's most visible to is always the client. Um, you can always pull a client, particularly one that is like that unique overlap client that had products for multiple companies, um, and you can instantly see how they're not seeing one experience. Um, and that's ultimately what we wanted to change so that we could, we could understand how to change their outcomes. Um, we might be great today, um, but with, if we uh, you know, aren't in the driver's seat and we, we don't understand how the dials work and how the gauges work, we will be driving blind and we could effectively um, you know, disrupt this client experience. So for Waystar, um, we needed a lot of things um, related to client success. Um, but ultimately, they came down to, to these three, um, related to these three challenges. So we had knowledge that was lost. Um, naturally, when companies come together, and this isn't necessarily in client success, it's across the organization. Either people leave, or they change roles, or something happens related to the model um, with, with that. And, and that is something we instantly need to address. Um, second is process variation. We, t we talked about that earlier, but each company either had their own process for X, and if they came from that legacy company, they assume that it's still X, where you know company B assumes it's Y, or maybe the startup didn't even have a process for that. They just you know, talked to the CEO and they got it when they needed it. Um, and so you, you have all of these folks coming together and needing to align. Um, one example is, um, it's pretty simple, but What's the definition of a client? Um, we have, behind closed doors, had heated discussions uh, about the definition of a client um, and really thinking about the engagement model. You know, is it in a, uh, a health system? Is it only the institutional side or the uh, inpatient side? Is it the professional side as well? Does that include the home, home care side that's affiliated with that health system? How do you organize them together? Where do you engage at what point? Who engages and when? Um, and even to answer something as fundamental as who is your client um, can, can stroke you know, a, up a lot of emotion um, and, and was a big part of uh, kind of the early days of, of building out client success. So why to Tango? Um, so really, I mean, we needed a, a platform that could help support our scale and our speed. Um, and ultimately, we needed a transformational approach. Um, we knew it wasn't going to happen overnight, but we felt like we were in a good position um, to actually define and deploy almost at the same time. Um, so I know some maybe mature companies have, you know, they've documented their whole customer life cycle. They have all of these processes, and they're ready to just like push them into the software. We were actually in a unique position where we had a bunch of stuff, right, from legacy companies. It wasn't all unified yet, and we actually wanted the flashpoint and almost the forcing function of the software to go success block by success block and define out and build uh, and roll the standardization in, in blocks versus you know, trying to push everything at once. Um, 
So we needed to unify and improve our client experience. Um, and these were, um, these were actually business cases. One thing I didn't mention, but I'll pause here is, um, yeah, I mentioned I was in the role for two years. Within the first couple of months, I knew we needed something like this. I didn't know what this was. I didn't know who Tatango was, but I knew there had to be something out there that could help kind of unify and, and drive the change management and standardization that I, that I knew we needed. Um, ultimately, we had to get alignment across the organization um, with people that, frankly, I didn't even know because they're in different geographies and different offices, um, and we were still kind of coming together as a company. Um, and, and you know, obviously, one thing that was hugely instrumental was building out business cases and you know telling our story. So these were these were huge levers in our business case, and something we're still fanatically focused on ensuring that we're delivering against. So obviously, increasing retention rate, um, accelerating upsell and cross sell, um, and scaling our resources. Um, it's quite simple, and obviously. We had all the Excel spreadsheets and the math and everything behind it to make our case, um, but that was at the core. Um, from there, as a company, our goal um, at the outset with integrations was really to integrate these companies successfully, to grow them concurrently, and to implement systems and processes that help us win. And that last one is really, for me, a to tango is a huge part of that um, solution. And this is, my team knows, a few here, um, on every single team agenda, this is the top of my agenda. It's something that's very top of mind for me and a constant question to ensure that we're nudging our organization in this direction um, and knowing that M&A is not stopping. So we have to be ready for it. That, that is the constant. Um, from here, we knew we needed to maintain speed or even go faster, scale and grow. Um, so we needed that consolidated view of the client across all these legacy companies uh, we needed one view. We needed to be able to see that at any given time. Um, we also knew that we are going to continue to have multiple systems. That's not going away. I had data everywhere. Um, it kept me up at night thinking about every place that I had data and spreadsheets and CRM systems and NPS. Um, I knew I needed to get that into one place, but I also um, I, I needed it to like have some governance as well. It's not just about getting data in. It's about you know, seeing, you know, is this telling me the right thing? How can I test it? How can I validate? And what's been incredible now that we're live is I can literally f on the fly with our Salesforce team pull a segment and show them data inaccuracy in Salesforce, like, like without even prep. Um, because the, you know, we've been able to get all the data in one place and I can query and ask questions or test hypotheses. Um, visibility into client health, this was super important, and I would say from an executive standpoint, the thing that I feel like resonates with them, I, if I talk about client health, I can tell executives, you know, they're like very interested in that and how to, you know, dial in um, to the root causes of what, what, what is, um, you know, causing good or poor health. Um, an actionable example for us has been uh, looking at this by product. Quite simple, right? What's your client health by product? Um, and obviously, as practitioners, and you work in, you know, you're working here. You're, you know, you have hypotheses you want to test, right? You, you have instincts and gut, but sometimes it's hard to like prove that. Um, so I literally, actually, after a meeting with Jeff, I said, I bet I could ask Tango this question. And I went in and pulled the pulled the client health by product, and it was instant. I mean, anybody off the street would say you should go look at that product and figure out what's going on there. Um, and that has led to a series of additional conversations um, to make sure that we're addressing that. Um, standardizing, digitizing, and error-proof processes. I'm uh, Black Belt and Six Sigma process improvement, so pokey oak is a term about mistake proofing. So uh, you wanna give the process, serve up the process where the people need it when they need it and make sure that they can't make a mistake. And by doing that, um, you know, one, could, one side of that is, oh, that's overly prescriptive. You're kind of taking, you know, these are professionals. You're taking that, that you know, their ability to be free and, and do that work. Um, the other side is actually you're empowering them and you're taking sort of that noise or their need to ask their boss a question out of it by just serving up the information that they need and then allowing them to do the work and allowing them a feedback feedback loop to help improve the process. Uh, and it certainly, from an overhead standpoint, takes away a ton of burden. Um, obviously, any new team member onboarding, we just actually have two new team members that started uh, 
last week. Um, and so I'm very excited to, to help onboard them with Tatango. Um, and then define and test and iterate on client engagement models. This was an area we um, had to find some engagement models. It was a little bit like I hope people are I hope people are doing quarterly on-sites with performance reviews. I try to track it, um, but we can serve it up. You know, make sure to do this on-site. Remind your um, remind your team members to engage at the right point and kind of take that thought process out. Um, and then, last but not least, and this is an area we haven't quite um, uh, gotten there yet, but we're already driving up the use cases. It was really around like multi-channel client engagement. So I should have mentioned in the beginning, but my team works primarily with our high, high value, um, our largest clients, so about 500 clients of our 22,000 client base. Um, and so we tend to do things the old fashioned way, right? High touch, in person, um, not super scalable. Um, you know, people love working with clients, that's, that's why they're there. Um, but being able to leverage the campaign functionality and being able to also interact with our clients at scale, particularly a lot of things that are a little bit more administrative and just need to get out, and it, it, um, we can kind of take some of that burden off of CSMs, which um, I'm, I hope they're excited about that. Yeah, I get head nods back there. Um, so uh, effectively, why to Tango? Like, we needed a transformational approach. This wasn't going to be incremental. Yes, could we get a little bit better? Could we work on, you know, close the loop NPS a little bit more? Absolutely. But to really start to kind of build up and break through and have, you know, um, start to have that flywheel effect by pushing and pushing, um, we, you know, we could, uh, we could achieve great things. So. I'll end on this slide, and it's a little bit of a build. Um, and I'll tell you, and unfortunately, Ella left. Ella, Ella is our CSM, but I, I'll, I'll say a few words about Ella. She's been phenomenal. Um, but at Waystar, we use a lot of mountain motifs. Um, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of dialogue you can have around the, the imagery of a hike and summits and breaks, where you have an opportunity to look where you came from and an opportunity to look where you're going. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, our partnership with Tatango and um, with the mountain and hiking motif. So we, we um, kicked off beginning of May, and we were um, live by the end of June, um, which is incredible. And a few notes about that, and I, I wrote them down because um, we had to define our data needs. We had to get the data. And remember, we, this wasn't like one CRM where we were just like hooking up Salesforce. Data was like literally every, everywhere. Um, so we had to find all of the data, you know, clean it, get it in. Um, we designed processes live. I think we gave Ella a heart attack a few times when she thought we'd be prepared for, like, like we'd like have this document for her. And we're like, that's why we're here, Ella. We thought we were just going to do it. You've got us for a couple of days. Let's just do it. Um, we had, I think, one of the largest configuration teams at Tank for a Tatango project. Um, which was awesome because we needed, we needed everybody's help. Even our project manager came from IT. He joked, he's like, you're the only project I've ever gotten work from. I was like, well, we needed, <laughs> we needed everybody's help. Um, we created new segments. So we literally looked at our business and defined brand new segments um, to really think about how we want to engage with our clients. We built out client health criteria that we will, of course, continue to iterate on. We tested it, we trained, and we launched. Um, and that's really, I mean, that's really just the beginning. And I do want to pause here for a second. Ella Ang is phenomenal. She was our client, she is our client success manager, and she's been with us since the beginning. Um, Monique, you're here from sales. You were incredible and still are incredible. And Val, um, Val's not in the room, but Val was the engineering side under Sumant. And Val and, Eng, or Val and Ella, Ella Ang, they should have a podcast, in my opinion. They have... I don't, I, if you've ever worked with them, they have this very interesting banter that is like so enjoyable to listen to. And I always joke there should be like a, a weekly Tatango podcast with Ella and Val, like just talking through and, and debating whether or not something can or cannot be done and how um, they crack me up. And so with that being said, uh, we are uh, less than two weeks away from going live with our next um, our next phase, um, which will be an additional three success blocks expansion for cross-sell upsell. 
Um, so we partner with our sales team on that, which we've been really getting good feedback. Um, our nurture programs, which is really around our engagement model and making sure that we can kind of codify that process. And then our reference program, um, really around our client advocacy and making sure we're rewarding and recognizing our clients. Um, so I mentioned kickoff to go live in eight weeks. I won't go through all of those things I, I, I did already, um, but ultimately we're just, we're only like midway through this mountain. Um, and you know, we want to get to number one. That's me, that's my Bitmoji. Um, for client <laughs> outcomes and waste our outcomes to really be able to simplify and unify uh, healthcare revenue cycle enabled by Tatango. And that's it. Um, Katie, Jeff, thank you so much. That was amazing, especially about the um, challenges in the healthcare. We love it and we hate it, right? Um, I was privy to the workshop, the initial workshop mm -hmm. where you said literally two days you had your team. So from a readiness point of view, you said, I didn't have a lot, but I knew what I needed. And then I think from our side, it was a very skinny staff. And so the ratio was pretty amazing that from readiness to execution, um, how you just came to and just made it happen. And so my question for you is that if you could do it differently, if you could do it <laughs> over again, what would you do and what would you advise the audience here? From a readiness point of view, from, ex you know, from a design to a strategy, to working with some smart people, and then is it really about the product that helped you get there so much faster? Like what were some of the things that was uh, incredible moments for you? That's a good question. Two, two things come to mind and they're a little unrelated. Um, one is, I say this because hindsight's 2020. I'm not sure I would have done it differently, but more alignment within the organization. So we, you know, we're dependent on others for data, for example, and just, you know, it, we were we spent a lot of time kind of convincing um, our, our needs, even after it was signed off on and kind of went, and, and we kind of continued. So to the extent that we would have um, been able to kind of breeze through that a little bit more, I think it, it would have helped. I'm not, in hindsight's 2020, I, I can't say um, if I would have done that differently. But then the other, maybe, I had actually taken counsel I was fortunate to be at the Napa event in the spring and I had, um, we just signed, like just literally like signed and I like got on a plane. Um, I asked a lot of people about implementation and one thing everybody said was like, you know, start small, iterate, like, so I took that under advisement. I thought I did. Honestly, we would have been f faster. And th the whole point is once you get live, you, you have something and you start to, you can share it and you start to like get that momentum. So, so speed is pretty valuable in this space. So even if we would have scaled it back a little bit more and if it just gone live with like the data segmentation and client health, and like, I think we might have, we, we might have aligned the organization even faster. So I thought we went really small and we could have probably even started with less. I think I think um, we're out of time, but I want to again thank Katie and Jeff so much for sharing your insights uh, and success to date. It's been a pleasure to work with you both, and uh, welcome everyone to move on to the next session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.